to Matthew chapter 16, in one hand, John 20 in the other. Matthew chapter number 16, verse 17. Get that in one hand, and then John chapter number 20. And uh, verse number 22 in the other. Matthew 16, 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, John 20, verse 22. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now watch verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word now. Bless it to the hearts of the people. I pray that you'd anoint it as it goes forth tonight, as it is the word of God, not the word of men. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. You don't have to read the Bible long before you begin to understand that God makes a definite difference between the profane and the holy. And uh, it would behoove all of us to learn the difference between the two, the profane and the holy. Aaron had two sons that paid with their lives because they did not differentiate the profane and the holy. Nadab and Abihu offered a strange fire unto the Lord and God consumed them with fire. There wasn't much grace in the Old Testament. Sometimes God would come down in judgment and right on the spot they'd pay dearly for it. And uh, they did not, uh, they did not uh, make a clear difference between the profane and the holy. The fire was only to be taken from one place. It was the fire that God had sent down from heaven. They took strange fire into the holy place and God smote them for it. The, uh, the commission given to these apostles is a powerful thing in John chapter number 20, verse 22. And I must confess to you tonight, it's one of the most powerful statements in the whole New Testament. The Roman Catholic Church builds its priesthood on these two passages. It establishes them. It establishes its priesthood on the premise that they are able to uh, absolve you of your sins. And because of their priesthood, that therefore they can... They can, uh, they can come as, a, as an intermediary between you and God. Proof text, John 20, 22, Matthew 16, 17, and 18, and other passages they use to establish that authority. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. Number one is that these are apostles that this was given to. I'm not saying that there's not a perpetuity here. There could very well be. But it is no question that it is apostles. These are apostles that he breathed on in John chapter number 20. And apostles had the unique gift of writing scripture, which we don't have. Some profess to be able to, but they don't. And these apostles, therefore, are given this authority to literally open up heaven and shut it. And the apostle Peter in the book of Acts, he did open heaven. He opened it to Cornelius and, and, uh, and others. And when he preached there in Acts chapter number uh, two to the house of Israel, uh, he, in a sense, was opening heaven. There's some, still some things about it that can't be explained. And the reason I say that is the Apostle Paul exercised some of this authority. And he wasn't one of the twelve. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, you'll see him exercising this authority. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 4. The Apostle Paul said, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan. 
for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This is life and death. The apostle Paul delivered this man over to die. Now exactly what he did is still in, is still in question. The scripture said he had his father's wife, but was that his mother or was that his mother, uh, his, you know, his mother, his mother-in-law? Or wouldn't be a mother-in-law, be stepmother. Was it his stepmother or was it, was it his, or was it his mother? I'd like to think it was a stepmother, but you can't prove it one way or another by the wording. It's a heinous thing. It's a vile sin. And it seems like certain sins in the Bible, the Almighty won't mess with them. And he took him out of this world. But notice that his spirit was saved. Notice that even though he had committed such a vile sin as this, he still went to heaven. That's quite a thing. Notice what it says in verse number five. To deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So a man can commit a sin that will take him from this world. Now, this one here would match very well with 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number uh, 16 where you see a brother sending a sin unto death. And it, because this obviously this man is a brother. And being a brother, uh, he falls under a different, uh, a different scrutiny from God. There's no doubt probably he'd been chastened beforehand for this. And the chastisement from God did not do anything to change his life. And so he paid for it. The spiritual aspect involved here, because it's in the church, if you'll notice that it is corrupting people, the sin of this man is causing people to be puffed up in the church house, in the body of Christ. So it's therefore sowing division among the brethren. It's causing heartache and sorrow and confusion, a lot of confusion. A lot of people, no doubt, were saying, how in the world can this man be saved and, and live in this kind of a lifestyle? So, you know, a lot of, a lot of ramifications from this, uh, this sort of sin. And uh, it falls into the category of the profane and holy because it's the body of Christ. It's what affects the body of Christ. Here's another passage that um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 30 <laughs> And this is a direct reference to the body of Christ. If you go back to verse 29, and you can read the whole chapter for that matter, but to go back to verse 29 to kind of get a hold of the context. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. There's spiritual discernment. There's the profane and the holy. See that? Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many, what? Sleep. They that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. These people are dead. They're dead to this world. They're gone. And why are they gone? They're gone because of what they were doing in the church house. They were not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean? You think about it. What do you mean discerning the Lord's body? Well, the Lord's body is this body sitting in this house tonight. You're the Lord's body. You're the body of Christ. There's no question about that. And... Uh, you don't want to come against the body of Christ. You don't want to do that because that's, that body of Christ is sanctified and set apart unto the Lord. So, you know, we started talking about sin. We started talking about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the different aspects and perspectives on sin. Everybody in this house tonight is guilty of sin. Everybody. Whether a man admits it or not is irrelevant. Everybody on this earth is guilty of sin. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, when I would do good, evil is with me always. I find in my flesh no good thing. So with the mind, I serve the law of God. And with the flesh or the body, I serve the law of sin. And the Apostle John said in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's clear. That's very clear. If somebody has taught you that you can live a holy, sanctified life above sin, somebody lied to you. Not in this world. Not in this world. It won't happen. So when we look at each other, we think, what is the standard and the measure that we live by? You want to live. You want to live as long as God wants you on this earth until he gets ready to take you home. 
you presume to, uh, to take your life, that's presumption. To commit suicide is presumption. You're presuming on the mercy and the grace of God and you're taking something into your own hands that you shouldn't. Your life is in the hands of God, not your hands. For me to live is in the Lord Jesus. I live and move and have my being in Him. He gives me the very breath that I breathe. If I walk in fellowship with God, I walk in light. And that light means that I understand my nature, I understand who I am, and I understand that I'm not a perfect man. And I understand that there's somewhere I've got to find that I can live with God and I can walk before Him and have fellowship and communion with Him. Because that's what I want. But I also acknowledge the fact that I have imperfections. I'm not a perfect man. And uh, uh, there's, no, there's no man in his right mind would want you to follow him around for 24 hours a day, hear everything he says, see everything he does, or be able to read his mind. You don't want that to happen. I don't want it. I don't want anybody following me around 24 hours a day. These people that are on the Internet, they got these cameras, and they're watching everything they're doing. They're in an apartment, and, they, and, they, and, and they, they, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen them or not, but they've got people are living and they got cameras set up in their house and they're watching everything they do. That's the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> well, you might as well lock me up in a prison. <laughs> uh, I like my privacy. And the, Bible's, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro beholding the evil and the good. God sees all things. You can't hide anything from Him. But I don't get on the housetop and announce to the world everything I'm doing. <laughs> And you're wise if you don't do that. And you're wise if you understand that your life that you're living before God is a life that God is allowing you to live and you're not in rebellion against the Lord. Is everybody in this house tonight satisfied that the life you're living is not leading to death, that the life that you're living is in fellowship, you're in somehow or another in fellowship with God and you're not about to be struck dead in your tracks? You following me? Uh, if you are not living a life like that, then it means that you are either in rebellion or just plain ignorance. And this is what this series of, of, of teachings is about. It's about finding somehow or another where you live and you can live before God. Now, I know a preacher, and I believe he's dead now because people started elevating him to a position and he allowed him to do it. They, all, they almost made him the fourth person of the Trinity. And people have a tendency, that's true, but people have a tendency to do that. And he didn't stop them. He should have gotten up in the pulpit and he should have made it very plain and clear to them of who he was and where he came from, like I do before you all the time. I tell you and I, and I, I make it clear and I will until the day I'm gone that God called me out of hell and he saved me and I'm here by the grace of God and it's what he saved me from, thank God, that I am ashamed, I'm ashamed of the kind of life I used to live, but thank God that's not what I am now. I'm not that anymore. But I'm not some kind of a super saint. And, uh, and that uh, when I get up in front of you and I say over and over again, I'm just the messenger, folks. Just the messenger. That's all I am. I'm a messenger. And that's what I am. I have no holy anointing healing ability or some holy anointing calling that sets me apart above and beyond you. No, sir. No, sir. That doesn't exist. I have no part with that. But I have no part with preachers who think they are. And this man's dead. I mean, he, God, took him from the face of the earth. And I thought when he died, I thought, well, the, the, the body of Christ is making it just fine without him. <laughs> it made it just fine before he ever showed up, and it's making it just fine without him. And that's been some time back, a few years back, but... I observe things like that. And while they're here, you get the idea, Lord have mercy, where were we? What happened to the church before he ever showed up? And what's going to happen to the church when he's gone? Church is going to go right on. Go right on. The church will, go, the church will be fine and it'll go right on when this messenger's gone. Go right on. And that's the way it ought to be. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you about things, you need to listen. Now, every sin that a man can commit is not recorded in the Bible. You understand what I mean by that? But the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. But that's a general term. So every possible scenario that can happen to you, you can't go to the Bible and open it up and say, oh, there it is. 
No, it's not there. Well, then what do I do, preacher? See, that's a good question. Don't you think? That's a good question. <laughs> that's a very good question. What do I do? You need discernment. You need the voice of God. You need prayer. The scripture talks about that thing which a man allows in his life that the Lord allows and that by the grace of God, he can live. That's the individual. That's all of us as individuals in this house tonight. We have to live with that in our heart about where God says, now this is for you and this is the life you're going to live and we can have fellowship and communion with each other if you live that kind of life and you seek his face and you pray and you ask the will of God about anything that comes up in your life and you're not sure of it. A lot of, there's no way in the world in one message I could cover all the stuff that could happen to a human being. But everything that happens to you, anything that's part of your life, you ought to be praying about it and you ought to get peace about it. If there's no specific statement about it in the scripture, then you need to bring it before God and you need to get peace about it. Now, the things that are clearly recorded in the Bible, you don't need to pray about them. Are you following me? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Lord, is it okay for me to run around and chase women? No, it's not. That's adultery. See? Well, they do it in this, country, in this culture today. Uh, Lord, you know, it's no big deal. It doesn't make any difference. He said in 1 John, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, we've got 10 clear commandments in the Bible. We find them over there in the book of Exodus. 10 of them. These are clear commandments. Well, you say, I'm a preacher, that's the old Bible. No, that's the Bible, folks. When, the, when that rich young ruler came to it, and he said, all these commandments I've kept. The Lord said, I know you have, but here's one you haven't. And he, and he added to that the motive of the heart because it can't be written down in stone. But the Ten Commandments are written in stone. And you know something, folks? Not a one of them are changed. None of those commandments have changed. The one commandment that would, be, that would be as far as you as a Gentile and me as a Gentile that would be in question would be, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Remember that one? All right, now when is the Sabbath day? Let's get that nailed down first. When, when is the Sabbath day? Has it ever changed? The Lord arose from the dead. He arose from the dead any time after Saturday at 6 p.m. until any time because the day begins with the Jewish calendar, the Jewish day, at sunset. So any time after 6 p.m., he could have risen from the dead. Now, I was raised up being taught that the Sabbath was Sunday, that it was called the Christian Sabbath. Now, there's a lot of people believe that. They're good people. Uh, maybe your mother and father, maybe you believe that, you know. Uh, a lot of people believe that. The town I wrote, uh, when I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, you go downtown. When I was 15 years old, you could go downtown to Gay Street and nothing was open. That was Sunday. I think they called them blue laws, didn't they? Something like that. All right. Why? Because that was the culture. That was the culture of the day. I'm not even saying it was all that bad <laughs> for that matter. But the bottom line is there is absolutely no scriptural authority for you to call Sunday the Sabbath. Why? Because Christ is our Sabbath. Amen. Hebrews chapter number four, Sabbath means Shabbat in Hebrew, means rest. And Sabbath is the day of rest. And the Lord Jesus is our rest. And we've rested from our labors in him. He becomes our Sabbath. See, you know, it's no longer a day, it's a person. As I've said to you before, all these things that, are, that you do this and you have this and this thing and that thing, it's all a person now. The Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. So, so, uh, for, so for someone to come along and, and call Sunday the Sabbath, you know, is, uh, that's a preference that they make. And, and as I say again, good people say it, and I'm not up here to run people down. And a lot of people mean well, but I don't buy it. A long time ago, I began to look into my Bible and I thought, where do they get this business of Sunday being the Sabbath? No, it's Saturday. Now, after having said all of that, where in the Bible did God ever tell a Gentile to keep the Sabbath day? See, that's the issue. The Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel. And he would even have someone stoned to death if they broke that Sabbath. And remember, the Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. And one man went out and picked up sticks and he was stoned to death 
for breaking the Sabbath day. I wouldn't want to live under that, would you? I'm glad for the grace of God. I'm glad for the grace of God. So the Sabbath day was never given to a Gentile. It was given to the Jews as a sign. So when we go back to the Ten Commandments, remember, I, the reason I pull that out is because that's one of them. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's one of those commandments. And so if you've got the Ten Commandments today and somebody says, well, I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments, then keep it on Saturday and not Sunday. You have no authority. You have no authority to change the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. And uh, we have a lot of people out there who know that, and they're Christians. And uh, I, I remember a few years back, I met a pastor from a church, and he called the Seventh Day Sabbath, uh, what was they called them? Seventh Day Sabbath, Sabbath Church or something like that. But they weren't, these were not uh, uh, Seventh Day Adventist, like you normally think they were. The, the Seventh Day Church of God or something like that. I forget what it was. But they kept the Sabbath on Saturday. And uh, I didn't argue with him about it. If he wants to keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. The Bible said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If you esteem one day above another, then let that brother do that. If a person wants to do that, you can do that. Paul said in Romans uh, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in those chapters long in there. And what, pardon? 14, 14th chapter of Romans. If you want to do that, that's okay. God says you can do that. If you want to hold a day aside and call it a Sabbath day, I mean, keep the Sabbath day. Don't call it a Sabbath, but to keep the Sabbath, that's fine. But uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't come down on someone who, who, uh, who, who, who understands. So the Ten Commandments is written in stone. It is God's moral declaration to man about righteousness. Thou shalt not kill is one of those commandments. Did you know it says that? Thou shalt not kill. But did you know that the New Testament interprets that passage for you? And the reason I bring that one up is because that's so very important. Do you know what it says in the New Testament? Thou shalt do no murder. That's what kill means back in Exodus in the, tenth commandment, in the Ten Commandments. That means that you're not placed in a passive situation. In Luke chapter 22 when he said, uh, sell your garment and buy a sword. You're not put in a passive situation. It's okay for you to defend your family and defend yourself. And uh, if you're forced to, uh, go to war. And uh, I hate war. Lord have mercy, I hate war with a passion because so many innocents die in war. And believe this, so many are enriched beyond belief because of war. You got that right. So uh, I, I despise it. I'm not a warmonger. I despise war. But sometimes there's no alternative. There's no choice. And so you have to do what you have to do. So the New Testament interprets the Ten Commandments for you. That's the point here. Thou shalt do no murder. All right. Why do I say that? I say that because the Bible is very clear about certain things as it applies to the way a man ought to live his life. And if the Bible makes a clear statement about something in the Scripture, then there's no argument about it. See? There's no argument. You don't need to pray about it. God condemns it in the Word of God. That's it. But there are areas in your life and places in your life that you may wind up, and you may wind up being somewhere or doing something that you're not even sure about. But because of the situation or whatever it may be, you need, to add, you need light on it. You need light. You need understanding about how, is this the will of God? Is God okay with this? That's when you need to be doing some praying. And I believe the Holy Spirit will communicate to you. He said, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. So the light means that I'm willing, Lord, I'm, I'm here, I'll hear you. What do you have to say about this? I don't want to be, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm, sure, I'm unsure about it. And on it goes. Now, I can, you know, TV's been beat to death and I, Rightfully so, no, no doubt about that. And you, well, you know as well as I do that there's so much stuff on television today that is ungodly as it can be. And you know, you need, to, you need some discernment. When you're sitting in front of a television screen today, you need some real discernment. Because I mean, there's garbage on there. And it's gonna suck the very life out of your soul. It's gonna, it's, it'll destroy you spiritually. But not just TV, the internet. 
That's the Wild West. And when you get into the Internet, there's really no controls or restraints. And anything goes. It's wild, wild west. And then, of course, the culture around you, where you are, where you, you're living, folks, in Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, you're living in it. It's not going to become that. It is that. That's the culture that you're a part of. It's, it's, it's happened, and here we are. We're right smack in the middle of it. Your children are growing up in this culture. The sad thing is that your children are not you 25 or 30 years ago. They're not growing up in the same culture you grew up in. If you want to try to make it the same as it was back then, uh, I wish the best for you. But the bottom line is you're going to find your children faced with temptations, pressures that you did not know. And you're going to need wisdom from God. You're going to have to, you're going to, have, to have discernment. How am I going to, where, where am I going to let my kid go? Uh, who can be their friends? Well, what can they read? You know, all this stuff. Well, there's no specific thing in the Bible about some of these things. That's where you need wisdom. You need the wisdom of God when it comes to, comes to things like that. This is why the Christian life is not something, if God could give you a book and everything that could possibly ever happen to a human being was spelled out verbatim, in other words, it had an index in the back of it, and all you had to do was find that in the index and it'd take you straight to that scripture, that'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it's not. There's a whole lot of stuff in there that there's no index for and you need to do some praying. Now, your attitude toward what I just said is really a huge mark of your spiritual condition. Because a man gets to the attitude to where I don't care what God's word says. I mean, we're all here. Good night. We're going to be okay. We're going to the same place. See, you've got the wrong attitude. And that attitude is going to cost you dearly. You should have the attitude, Lord, you've got me in this world. And I'm going to be here till you come to get me. And I want to live for you. And I'm, 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 a, I'm a faltering human being. And I've got my problems. But I need your help. I need your discernment. Show me. And give me strength to deal with this issue and show me how to live my life in this age of 2016. I think that will go a long way in understanding what's going on here. Do you know what it says over there in the book of Acts about Herod who gave a big speech, great speech? He had just killed James. He just killed him. And he saw that it made the people happy, bloodthirsty bunch. So what did he do? Somebody tell me. He just killed James. Yeah, Peter put him in ward and he was going to, he was going to probably cut his head off. And it was that night that the angel came by and smoked Peter on the side and said, wake up, Pete. He was dead asleep, really worried about dying the next day. <laughs> I mean, he was really worried, <laughs> sleeping like a baby. <laughs> the angel said, get up from there. And the gates opened up and away they went. You know the story. Rhoda came to the door and they were praying for Peter. And she saw him, and she was scared to death and went back and told him Peter's the door. And they said, no, it's not Peter, it's his angel. But anyway, later on, Herod gave a speech, and they said, it's the voice of a God. Now think about what happened. The Bible said God smote him, but why did he smite him? That's right. That's the key, brother. Here is a pagan, here's a pagan king that had blood on his hands the blood of the martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet God was willing to be gracious to that murdering pagan king. He was willing to be gracious to him. But he didn't give God the glory. And God will not share his glory with anybody. And the Bible said he smote him and the worms ate him when he hit the floor. Isn't that something? You know why? He did not make a difference between the profane and the holy. God is holy, holy, holy. There are certain things you don't touch. Let me give you just a few illustrations. Somebody comes down here to this altar and they're praying. You may have fallen out with them. You may have, you know, you, 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 you all may have been the best buddies and now you won't speak to each other. But they're serious and they get up and they come down here and they get on their knees. They start talking to God. Leave them alone. That's holy. <laughs> That's holy ground. That's holy ground. Are you following me on that? 
there are things that are powerful and they mean something. And when a soul is making an approach to God, don't get in their way. Let them go. Pray for them. If you can. If you can't pray for them, go with them. <laughs> and the two of you get down in the altar and talk to the Lord. Amen. You know, this business of uh, holy and profane, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've probably seen too many people die. I probably have. It, you know, I'm just a human being, and after a while, you, uh, I'm like a doctor. I see an awful lot of stuff, folks. I see a lot of things. And uh, there for a while, when I first started the ministry, you know, I had, I've got this kind of mind that has to figure everything out. I got I got to, why is this thing ticking? Well, what caused that to tick to cause that to tick? Where'd this come from? You know, that's, that's, kind of, that's just on the way out here. I'm sitting here looking at a pickup truck and the back bed is up like this and the rear tail light's knocked out and it's rusting. And I thought, it's been a while since that happened. I mentioned it to my wife. She said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I pull, I pull up behind the car and it's got 15 or 16 tags on it, little old stickers on the back of it. I start reading every one of them and I start putting them all together. And, I, and I, in my mind, I figure out who's driving that thing. And then I'll pull around them and most of the time, yep, that's what I expected to see right there. <laughs> I don't know if that's a curse or a blessing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Man, when I was a boy, I walk into a room, I didn't miss anything. And I, I could go back in that room and a month or two later, anything had been moved. I knew exactly what had happened. I went over here to the other day to, the, to a Cracker Barrel to eat, and they got a big backhoe sitting over there. And the last three or four times we've been over there, that backhoe sitting there facing the parking lot. But the other day when we went, the backhoe was facing the other way. And I thought, I wonder why they moved that thing around. <laughs> now, <start leaving. laughs> now, that's... I know it's crazy. I started looking for tracks. I thought, where'd this thing come from? I looked up into the woods, and I thought, are they working up there? And, it, you know, it'd drive you crazy. It'd drive you screaming mad. But uh, not, not a dull moment. But you know something? I learned the hard way that there's no way you're going to figure out why everybody's dying. You may think you know why, but you don't know why. I've watched young people die. I've watched young people get killed in car wrecks. I've watched babies die. Precious little children. Uh, I've watched them. I've watched older folks. And I've moved on a long time ago from trying to figure out why everything's going on. Drive you crazy. We don't know, folks. We don't know. We don't know. We leave that in the hands of God. You see, I cannot intervene and go into their life and say, if you'll do this, you'll live. That is not making a difference between the profane and the holy. That's the holy one. That's the one that determines whether we live or die. That's the one who adds the years to our lives. The day that Prince died, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm not up here tonight to run Prince down. Uh, you know, I never listened to his music. I had no use for his music whatsoever, none. But uh, it's not that I had anything against it. I don't listen to that stuff. But anyway, all indication is he died from an overdose of drugs. That's sad. He was 50, 56 57 years old, something like that. That's sad, man. I mean, he, you know, he, it, from all indications, he died a premature death. And uh, he passed on. And, and, uh, and, and they made a big deal about it in the news media because apparently he was a great star for an awful lot of people. The same day that Prince died, Peter Ruckman died, April 21st. Not one word on TV about Peter Ruckman dying. Not a word in the national news media about Peter Ruckman dying. Not a word from any of them about Peter Ruckman dying. But I could not help but compare the two. Amen. I couldn't help but do it. Peter Ruckman lived to be 94 years old. Up until he was 83, he played uh, 
hockey. Can you imagine an 83-year-old playing hockey? He lived 94 years. Now, folks, I don't know if you all know much about preachers and controversy. Peter Ruckman's a very controversial person and all that. I got a lot of his books. I don't know if I got all of them, but I got a lot of his books. I've read a lot of his material. He is one of the smartest men that I've ever read, bar none. He's got a lot of warts, had a lot of problems, said a lot of things that people don't necessarily agree with, very controversial about some issues. Yes, absolutely. He's the kind of man that you either love or you hate. <laughs> you don't know whether to pucker or duck when you mention his name. <laughs> That's the kind of man he is, if you want to get on there and do, a, do some search into it. But here's the bottom line. This is why I brought this up. Uh, he, uh, he fought his fight. He fought the fight for the King James Bible. Amen. Fought it hard. Fought it long. And uh, he helped me when it came to that issue. And he helped me with a lot of doctrines, too, when I first got saved. Uh, God gave him 94 years. That cannot be denied God gave him 94 years, and he lived in relatively good health. He was standing on the street preaching when he was 93. He felt God call, felt like God had called him to go preach on the street. He went and preached on the street, and he was 93 years old preaching on the street. Here's the point. It was the will of God for that man to live 94 years on this earth. He must have done something right. Must have done something right. See? And Prince's life was cut short. So sad. So sad. And they're saying it was associated with drugs. That's so sad. You know those eight people up there in Ohio that were gunned down the other day? Eight people murdered up there in Ohio? They're saying that they were growing marijuana in their property, and they're, now they're saying that there might have been a connection with the drug cartel down there in in the, in the, in the, uh Mexico. I don't know. I'm not up here to run their name down. They're dead and gone. Eight people. There are certain things that you can do that will cut your life short. It will cut you short. Certain things you can do. No, make no mistake about it. Give your life to the Lord tonight and you may be surprised. He may add 10, 20, 30, 40. You may see your grandchildren. You may see your great-grandchildren. You may see your great-great-grandchildren on this earth. That is in the hands of God. How am I going to know that, preacher? Get on your knees. If there's something in your life you're not sure of, get it settled with God. Get it settled with God. If there's no clear statement in the Bible about it, get it settled with the Lord. If God gives you peace about it and it's okay between you and God, I'm not the one to step in between you and the Lord and intervene. That is what I live by, and I think that you can live by it too. Father, in thy holy name we pray. Use what I've said tonight, Lord, maybe to help somebody. Maybe somebody can be helped with it. There's so much, of, so much uncertainty in life. And Father, we come before thee in Jesus' holy name and pray for your leadership now. In thy blessed name we ask it, and amen.